Angela. Hello, Angela. Hi. Hello, Angela. Hi. Angela. Uh, also, we're videotaping the class so that we can use it for an online class this summer. And when we reviewed the uh, video from Monday's class, one of the things that we learned is uh, I think I moved too much. So I'm going to stand still. Uh, but more importantly, as COVID, we didn't hear the only, the only student voice that we heard on the tape was your voice. Yeah. Yeah. But that's good, but particularly those in the front row. And I think, I think uh, Katie, uh, if, if somebody's sitting on the back row because you're talking to me, they're going to talk louder. And somebody sitting on the front row is going to talk less. And so yes, agree that everybody will talk to Angela. And then Angela, if you can't hear them, or if you think the, uh, the microphone is not picking them up, uh, i tell you what I'll do. Next time I'll bring a book, and you can throw it at them. Okay. So first thing I want to do is collect the homework. So what I want you to do is I want you to take this cover sheet, I want you to rip it off. Then I want you to fold it vertically like this, and put your name on the outside. And, and Katie, I think since we're going to be doing this every class period, this is when you walk into class, why don't you just leave the uh, assignments on uh, Angela's table? And then Angela, it would be your job to collect. Okay. So, so for now, put your name on the outside, and then beginning next week, you'll have this done already, and I'll pass them back to Angela. So Linda, just pick up where we left off last time. We had defined consideration as simply doing something that you don't have to do or refraining from doing something that you have a legal right to do. So yes, apply that to our last example. David is the younger brother of Linda, and so David goes to the uh, store and asks for a lot of credit, and he says, I'm a wizard and I'm good looking. And they say, no credit. And then Linda, being a good sister, comes in and says, I will guarantee his loan. And then, David, what do you do? I charge $1,000 and plead for it to bed. <laughs> I have questions about, well, I guess, I guess Kelsey could be worse. He could be going with Keith Harrison. <laughs> could be going to Europe with Keith Harrison. Okay. So now the question is, do we have consideration? David, did you provide consideration to the store? Yes, I charged a thousand dollars. Which you did not have to do. So the answer is yes. David, did you provide consideration to Linda? No. Well, didn't you promise to pay off the debt? But notice that was not a promise to Linda, that was a promise to the store, and that was something you already had a duty to do. So the answer here is, oops. So the answer here is, ooh, which one are you on? So the answer here, once I get back to the slide. Okay, so the answer here is no. So Kelsey, what about the store? Did they do something for Linda? Yeah. But Linda does not get a personal benefit. And, and your Michael is saying no. Why? Does, the, does, it requ does consideration require, for example, if I say, paint Kelsey's, uh, uh, wash Kelsey's car, and you do that. That does not personally benefit me, but is that still consideration? So at Linda's request, did they do something they did not have to do? So that would be consideration? Hmm. Now, David, did the store provide consideration to you? Yes. Yes, they did something, they extended your line of credit, something they did not have to do. Linda, did you provide consideration to the store? Yes. You guarantee his, his, his line of credit. And Linda, did you provide consideration to David? Yes. He does not provide consideration to you, but you provide some consideration to him? Yes. So it seems like Linda, the only one not providing, providing consideration is the deadbeat brother. And so, therefore, do we have a contract? David, do we have a contract between you and the store? Yes. Because there's consideration going both ways. 
Linda, is there a contract between you and the store? Yeah. Because it's consideration going both ways. Linda, is there consider is there a contract between you and David? No. Why not? You gave him consideration, but he did not give consideration to you. So therefore, Linda, do you have to pay? Yes. Why? Since I have a contract. Since you have a contract. Everybody agree? So let's go to the uh, questions. Today. And as I said, again, this one of the things I want to do is to talk about a kind of thought problem. Where are you at, Candace? There you are. No, there you are. There you are. Sorry. There you are. You moved, didn't you? No. I was there with you. You moved. Five. No. Weren't you over there? No. So where were you? I, I was over there in your other class, but I'm here in this class. Sorry. Right. <laughs> so, Candace, which of the following will legally be binding despite? Lack of consideration. What do you say? Me. David, what do you think? Me. Why? Uh, because promissory estoppel. Promissory estoppel. Even though, and why is there no consideration? You have promised to give the church something. They did not give you anything back. But on the doctrine of promissory estoppel, Candace, as long as their reliance was reasonable, then the church could still enforce it. Okay, number two. So the answer is B. Uh, question number two, Allie and Kobe, Allie and Kobe, make sure you speak up, Kobe. Kobe, which of the following is, promises is supported by, leg by legally sufficient consideration when you enforce it? Kobe, what about A? A, prom a, prom a person's promise to pay a real estate agent and return real estate agents earlier act of not charging commission. No. Because that's past. Okay, so no. A parent's promise to pay one child $500 because that child is not as wealthy. No. Oh, we well, shouldn't show favorites anyway. <laughs> C, a promise to pay uh, the police $250, $250 to catch a thief. No. Why not? Because that's their legal obligation. So, pre existing duty. So, therefore, I hope the answer is D, promise to pay a minor $500. Yes. Does it matter that it's a minor? Now, that's first considerations concerned. Now, later when we talk about later when we talk about capacity, we'll learn that the minor can back out of the contract, but that has nothing to do with the consideration issue. So, so far so good. So, question number four. Oh, question number three. Donnie Cook signed a contract regarding of requiring Cook to be buying 500 of Dunn's, book, Dunn's books at 80 cents per book. Later, Dunn requested in good faith that the price be reduced to 70 cents per book. Hmm. Matthew, where are you at? Right. Matthew, the question, the, well, the topic for today is consideration. Yeah. So the topic for today is consideration. And Michael, which of the answers deal with consideration? Which one? C. C. So the answer is C. C. Very good. Now question number four. Question number four. Kelsey and Alex. In each of the following situations, does the first promise serve as valid consideration for the second promise? Well, Kelsey, I think we can eliminate a and B. Why can we eliminate A? Because the police officer has the pre-existing duty. And why can I eliminate B? Because the builder's promise to complete the contract is it's already there. Yeah. So the answer is either C or D. Yeah. And I think, Alex, this depends on the, the issue of liquidated debt and disputed debt. And Alex, remind me the difference. A liquid, and I don't like the terms, because to the accountant in me, Alex, oh, we moved too. Alex, the accountant in me says that a liquidated debt is one that's paid off. But in legal terms, a liquidated debt is one that's resolved. 
There is just no dispute. Therefore, to, for, to reduce that balance would require consideration. Yes, which means Kelsey, and, and the dispute of that means that, if, for example, if you say to me, Kelsey, you owe me $100 and I dispute it, then the world does not agree that I owe you the debt, and then you say, well, forget about it. That does not require consideration because you're not giving anything up. So Kelsey, the answer is D. D is in dog. Taylor and Sydney, where well, Taylor is here and Sydney is there. Uh, which of the following requires consideration to be binding on the parties? Um, <clears throat> Taylor, I think we can eliminate B because B has nothing to do with consideration. I think we can eliminate C. So therefore, Sydney, the answer is either A or B by the process of elimination. Now, I tell you what the answer is. And then you'll, you'll ask me, how do we, how do we know that? Uh, and, and I'll say, well, you remember it from legal environment. We'll learn next week when we talk about the UCC that a, under the UCC, the modification of a contract does not require consideration. But you ask a legitimate question, based upon what we have done in this course so far, how do you know this? Well, let me, let me suggest something that you can do, Sydney, to, here's an example where you you have are down to two possible answers, and I think it's either A or D. Now, here's a thought process that you, you can use. Would the law be more concerned with a contract involving land, or would the law be more concerned with a contract inv involving a shipment of toothpaste? What do you think? Land. So the answer is A. A. Number six. Turning whether consideration requirement of the form of contract is dissatisfied, consideration is changed by the parties the contract must be. Jody, this is a definitional question. Go ahead, would you? Hello. Jody, this is a definitional question. Yes, look at A. Is there any requirement that the consideration be of equal value? If I want to sell you my brand new car for $100, can I do that? Sure. Sure. So A is not correct. Greg, what about D? Well, it seems like to me D says the same thing that A says in different words, doesn't it? Yeah. A and D say the same thing, so I can eliminate both. Now, Jody, I'm down to B and C. Well, let's suppose I offer you, let's suppose last time I offered uh, Sydney $100 to do my tax return, and Sydney, you do the tax return today, and I'll pay you tomorrow. So Jody, C can't be correct, because it doesn't have to go back both at the same time. So Craig, by the process of elimination, the answer is B. I agree. And finally, the last one. Katie and AJ. Katie. Oh, you're next to each other. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Grove is seeking to avoid performing a promise to pay Brock $1,500. Grove is relying on lack of consideration. So, KDS start with D. The consideration performed by Brock will be performed by a third party. Is that right? We can have a contract that would say that, so no. Brooks asserted consideration is only worth $400. That's got to be right because we'll give him Brooke $1,500. So, the consideration has to be equal. No, there's no such a requirement. I can sell you my brand new car for $100. So C is wrong. AJ, uh, Brooks' only claim of consideration was the relinquishment of a legal right. So AJ, uh, I, my car uh, hit you. I, I, I negligently won my car into your car. And I say I'll give you $1,000 if you promise not to sue. Can we do that? Yeah. Sure. In fact, we do that all the time. So I think B is not correct. So that means AJ, the answer I hope is A. And prior to Grove's promise, Brooke had already performed the request to that. And so that would be last consideration. So the answer is A.
the notes for today. And so Lenny, I, I'm going to make one change to the notes. Do, can you guess which one, what change you want to make? We'll see when we get there. whether agreement is one or two issues. I think there are two. The agreement requires an offer and acceptance. Parties must show mutual cons assent to terms of contract. Once agreement is reached, if the other elements of contract are present, to meaning that would be consideration, legal subject matter, and so forth, then the contract would be enforced. Requirements of the offer. Offerer serious intention, definiteness of terms, and communication and offer reads. Delaney, so in open class Monday, in front of 20 witnesses, Sydney and I made a contract. I said to Sydney, will you do my tax return for $100? And Sydney, you said, yes. We shook hands on it in front of 20 people. Delaney, so do we have a contract? Why not? No serious person would think that I would ask Sydney to do my tax return. Therefore, anybody would know that it was a joke. Suppose, to, to me, suppose I'm driving, you and I are driving down the street in my car, and my car breaks down. And I, I, uh, I say, well, darn. Actually, I would say something else. But, <laughs> but Angela is taking this. I would say, darn, you know, I would sell this piece of crap for $100. You then turn to me and say, here's your 100 it's now my car. Maybe don't we have an offer? I made an offer. She accepted. There's consideration going both ways. And the fact that she's taken advantage of me doesn't matter. So why don't we have a contract? There's no serious. No serious person would think that I there was an intent. Uh, the offer has to be definite. David, what if I say to you, I'll sell you my car, and you say, okay, what's the problem? How much? Yeah. So it's not definite. Uh, and the offer has to be communicated to you. David, if I don't, if you don't hear the offer, you can't respond to the offer. Offer your serious intent. Contract is judged by what a reasonable person in the offeree's position would conclude about the offer. And again, sending my offer to you, no reason, you didn't really expect that I wanted you to do my tax return. I mean, I've had you in two tax classes. <laughs> <laughs> Where intent may be lacking. Expressions of opinions are not offers. Statement of the future intent is not an offer. Kobe, if I say to you, I plan to sell my house in the future, that's not an offer to sell today. Preliminary negotiations and invitations to negotiate. For example, Kobe, you say to me, how much would you sell your car for? Is that an offer? Let, let the record reflect that he's shaking his head no. You need to speak up. No, because that's simply a question. And again, there's no serious intent to make an offer. When intent may be lacking, advertisements are not offers. And if you will, Megan, think about this. Megan, suppose that you own a store. And suppose that you, what kind of store do you own? A shoe store. <laughs> you know, I was thinking that. Uh, <laughs> suppose that you own a shoe store. And you say, you run an ad in the newspaper and it says, half off. And you have, how many, how many pairs of shoes do you have in your inventory? 1,000 pairs. And 2,000 people come to your shop and say, we accept your offer. What's the problem? You don't have 2,000 shoes. You don't have 2,000 pairs. Actually, you do have 2,000 shoes. Because you have 1,000 pairs. But you don't have, so therefore, the law says that that's not, that an ad is not an offer. It's an invitation to make an offer. So therefore, you put in uh, the half price notice in the newspaper. I come in and I say, I'm ready to buy your shoes. 
I have made the offer to you. Does that make sense? So advertisements are not offers. Now, the caveat to this, the exception to this, Megan, if you say the first five customers will get a 10% discount. Greg, is that different? Yes. How is that different? It's an offer. Has she defined, well, yes, it's an offer, but how is it different? Why is it different? Has she defined what her risk is? <clears throat> when she says 50% off, then she can't accommodate 2,000 people. When she says the first five customers in the door, then that's definite enough to make it an offer. Options are not offer, not an offer or an invitation for an offer. And Kelsey, that makes sense because you don't want to go to an auction and be required to take the best bid because the best bid might not be high enough to meet your standards. So again, an auction is not an offer, it's an invitation. Termination or offer. An offer may be terminated prior to acceptance, and again, Selene, if I was doing this again, I would say, I would underline prior to acceptance <coughs> by either actions of the party or operations of law. Termination of actions of the parties. Revocation, Tellini, that terminates the offer. So I say to you, I'll sell you my car. You say, no way, the offer is in a bed. So what if I say to you, I sell you my car for $5,000. You say no, so I often sell you my car on Monday. You say no on Tuesday, on Wednesday you accept. Got the story? Monday I make her an offer, on Tuesday she says no, on Wednesday she changes her mind. She's, she's kind of flaky, so she, do we have a contract? Did, did you pick that up? She said sounds like that. Mm -hmm. Remember, <laughs> speak louder, speak to Angela. Yeah. Why? Because the offer was revoked when she said no. So the offer is no dead. So, so Lini, before you say no, think. Offer can be drawn anytime before offer accepts the offer. So that means, Kayla, I, tell, I say to Tolini, I will sell you my car for $5,000. And then two hours later, I call her up and say, I changed my mind. I, I've got the right to do that. It's effective, the offer, uh, I'm sorry, the termination is effective when the offeree or offeree agent receives it. So this is, this is an important issue. Toby, and this is often tested on CPA and Jim. An offer is, is effective when it's received. That makes sense. Toby, I mail you a letter and I say, I offer you to sell you my house. You obviously cannot respond to that letter until you, to that offer until you receive it. A, a, a termination is also effective when received. So if I, Kobe, if I orally say to you, I will sell you my house, and then on Tuesday, I orally tell you I will sell you my house, on Tuesday, you reply, and on Wednesday, notice this is before I get your letter. So Monday, I make you an oral offer. On Tuesday, you send me a written acceptance. On Wednesday, I revoke the, off the, off the offer. Kobe, can I do that? Before you get the letter. Before you write yes, the before I know. Yes. No, I can't do that. Therefore, once you've accepted it, so it seems like, it seems like, Seems like to me, Kobe, the law is biased in your favor. Candace, I think that makes sense because I'm the master of the offer, so the law should help out Kobe. I think that makes sense. So, uh, to continue, termination of actions of the party. Courts are generally unwilling to allow revocation when offeror has changed position based on judge, judge tribal reliance on the offering. And is, I think that's consistent with the, the doctrine of promise and estoppel. Termination by action of the parties. So Candace, I say to you, I will sell you my car for $5,000. And you say to me, gee, I'd like to think about it. 
But you know, I'm worried somebody else will get to it before I will accept before I do. So will you keep the offer open for me exclusively for five days? And I say yes. Michael, we got the story. I offered to sell her my car for five thousand dollars. She says, I want time to think about it. Will you hold the offer open for me for five days? I say yes. I've given my word. And remember how good Sydney's word was last time. Meanwhile, Greg, you come in and you say, I'll give you six thousand within that five day period. Can I sell to him without breaching my contract to you? You say no? Let me ask you this. Greg, what does she give me to hold the offer open? She gave me nothing. Which means, although I gave my word, there's nothing legally binding. Which means, can I sell to you? Yes. Yes. Now, yes. Candace, you don't like this, do you? No. So what can we do? The reason that I don't have to honor my promise to you, the reason that I don't have to offer honor my promise to you is that you gave me no consideration. So, give me a dollar. So you give me a dollar. Now, let's think about the consideration. Taylor, is it a consideration? I did something I don't have to do. I keep the offer open exclusively for her, and she did something she did not have to do. She gave me a dollar. Yeah. Is that different from the original story? Yes. Which means if I then sell it to Craig for 6000 she can now sue me for breach of contract. Because I did not, Taylor, Taylor, because I did not honor my word or because I breached the contract. And it seems like Sydney, my word is about as good as your word because I breached the contract. And we have a name for this. It's called an option contract. An option contract, Candace, is when the, there's a promise to hold an offer open for a specified period of time in return for consideration. Again, the difference then, too, is that in the first case, you did not give me anything for my promise. In the case, you gave me something. Now, AJ, does it matter that it's only a dollar? Nope. What she gave me, what she gave me a penny? What if she gave me monopoly money? It wouldn't matter. Wouldn't matter. Yeah, it wouldn't matter. Because she gave me something. Now, what if she gave me a counterfeit money that she knew would counterfeit and I did not? See, at least with the monopoly money, I know it's play money. But she gives me counterfeit money that she knows is counterfeit. I, I'm shocked that you would do that. I'm shocked. But if you, but now, what do you say, Agent? It matters. It matters because now she's committed fraud. What if she gives me counterfeit money when she doesn't know it's counterfeit? What do you think, Alex? I know why you're sitting there, so I can see you. Why, Alex? <laughs> I mean, it matters, but it won't hurt her. It doesn't matter. I mean, it matters to me because I've been ripped off, but she acted in good faith. I'll let you go. <laughs> Termination action is a party of rejection of the offer by the offeree. Rejection by the offeree expressed and implied terminates the offer, effective only when it's received by the offeror or offeror's agent. Okay. Can offer by the offeree, so. Uh, Candace, I say I will sell you my car for five thousand dollars. You say I will buy it for four thousand. What you've just done, you've done three things. You have countered my offer. You rejected my offer, and you made me a new offer. So now my offer is off the table, and now it's up to me to accept your offer or not. Um, mirror image rule at common law, not under the UCC, as we'll see later. Common law, any change in terms automatically terminates the offer. So when we say, Candace, when we say mirror image, that means that your acceptance has to exactly match my offer. So any, any material modification of the terms means that you reject it. 
uh, termination of operation of law, lapse of time. Linda, I say to you, I'll sell you my house for uh, $200,000. I offer that to you today. You say, I don't need money. And then, five years from now, you say to me, I accept your offer. Why? I made an offer. You made an acceptance. I did not. Megan, I did not put a time limit on the offer, but there's a reasonableness standard because obviously the house is going to be worth. Well, I, well. In most places, in most times, five years later, the house will be worth more. But these are not normal times. <laughs> this is personal. <laughs> if no time period for acceptance is specified, the offer terminates at the end of a reasonable period of time. So, 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 Linda, if you accept an offer a month from now, that's probably reasonable. Yes. Uh, if you accept an offer five years from now, that's clearly not. Kelsey, what, do you, what if she accepts the offer in six months? That's why we have juries to decide. Clearly, one month is reasonable. Clearly, five years is not. Six months, probably not, but maybe. Termination of operational law, destruction of subject matter. So I offer to sell you my house. No, I don't like this example. Uh, Keith Harrison <laughs> offers to sell you his house, and it's destroyed in a flood. It's washed away. It's on its way to the Gulf of Mexico. Linda, he's offered to sell you his house for and his house is worth less than mine, a little bit, uh, for 30000 And the house is destroyed, that terminates the offer, because he can't be, well, want mine. Well, he can't buy what doesn't exist. And you can't hold him to the offer. Termination of operation of law, death or incompetence of the offeror or offeree automatically terminates the offer. So Harrison dies. Acceptance is a voluntary act expressed and implied by the referee that shows agreement to the terms of the offer. Unequivocal, unequivocal acceptance, again, the mirror image rules. Silence is acceptance. So, Michael, if I say to you, I will sell you my house for $250,000, many go before $200,000, that's up to $250,000, and if I don't hear from you, by 5 o'clock on Thursday, I will assume the offer has been accepted. Can I do that? Sure, I can do that. But it would have no legal effect. Why? Why, is sil why can silence generally not be accepted? Because how do I know? How do I even know you've got the offer? So generally, and, and it seems like Kendon's, if, if, it seems like I'm kind of stacking the deck here. Money, time limits, general rule of biological contracts, except it's timely if made before offer is terminated. The mailbox rule. And this comes up after we see the exam. Acceptance is effective when the offeror uses the authorized means of acceptance. So, Kobe, I send you a letter by regular mail. And I say to you, I will sell you my house. That offer is not effective until you receive it. That offer is not effective until you receive it. If I revoke the offer, it's not effective until you receive it. So the offer is not effective until you receive it. And I think, Linda, that makes sense. Because you can't respond to an offer you have, does not have. The revocation of the offer is effective when you receive it. But notice the acceptance is when you send it when you put it in the mailbox. Great, it seems like to me that puts me in a bad position, doesn't it? That is, the offer is, is he, he is not legally, he does not legally have notice that I made him an offer until he gets it in the mail. He does not have legal notice that I uh, revoked the offer until he receives it in the mail. However, Brandon, he, I have legal notice 
that he's accepted the offer before I even know about it. Seems unfair, doesn't it? What, Brandon, what do, you, what do you suggest I do? Well, fortunately, Brandon, the offerer is the master of the offer. Notice that, notice that Brandon, the mailbox rule is the general rule. Can I overcome that? But can I, and since I'm the master, and Brandon, when I say the offerer is the master of the offer, <coughs> I mean, that means I control the terms. And one of the terms of the offer, Brandon, is the mode of acceptance. Mm -hmm. So can I, in the offer, overcome the mailbox rule? Yes. Yes. So the mailbox rule only applies if I don't say otherwise. So it would seem like, Brandon, that if I'm prudent and I know what I'm doing legally, if I get good legal advice, I'm going to put that in the offer. The offer, the accepting is not valid until I receive notice. Otherwise, Brandon, I, I, you called me, I'm stuck with the mailbox rule. Hmm. So here's just some examples. Determine if we have a valid contract or not, and again, which of the elements is missing. Alex has a missing cat, cupcake. And he posts a reward of $100 for a safe return. You don't care much for a cat, do you? Okay. Tell me, Jody, unaware of the offer of being a good neighbor of Alex, returned the cat. Jody, do you have a contract? No. Why not? You did not know about the offer, therefore you could not accept the offer. Now, now. Now, morally, should she pay you? Yeah. Yeah, but not legally. Two, the lady, and, and here's what I want to change. And please, if you have your computers with you, change Tallini to Keith Harrison, for reasons we'll see in a minute. So this is not Tallini, this is Keith Harrison. <coughs> Make a note to fix it. Then there's no record of my mistake. Except on the video. But we'll fix that. <laughs> the lady orally offers to pay Taylor's house for five hundred dollars. Taylor orally agrees. Taylor, do we have a contract? Yes. It's an offer, there's an acceptance. Same as number two, except that after Tellini and Taylor had reached agreement on painting the house, the next week Taylor asked Tellini, I'm sorry, Taylor asked Keith Harrison to also pay her tenant on the garage. Taylor, what's the problem here? Do we do we have a contract? We have a contract for you to paint, for her to paint your house. Do we have a contract for her to paint your son's house? No. Why not? There's no consideration. There's no consideration. Give her a dime. Give him a dime. Would that do it? Yes. Yes. Okay. Uh, same, um, same as number four, except the offer was made on Monday. Keith Harrison died on Tuesday. You see why I changed the name? Because Tellini, you have decades to live. He has weeds. Maybe that is. <laughs> have you seen him lately? I mean, he's, he's in bad shape. <laughs> for now, I think financial three did a minute. Keith Harrison died on Tuesday, and Taylor accepted the offer on Wednesday. Taylor, do you, we have a contract? No. No, the death of the offeror terminates the offer. Same as number four, except that Keith Harrison died on Thursday, all of the facts are the same. So any make since this is not you, this is Harrison, and since you're still alive and kicking. So let me think about this. She she accepted the offer before he died. But what's the subject matter of the offer? It's for him to paint her house. So Taylor, do we have a contract? No, not because, so in number four, we don't have a contract because of the death of the offerer. In number five, we don't have a contract because of the destruction of the subject matter. Subject matter is Harrison's labor. I like this example. <laughs> number six, Kelsey, same as number five, except the offer was made on Monday for Keith Harrison's employee to paint the house. Taylor accepted your offer on Tuesday, the employee began to work on Wednesday, and then Harrison died on Thursday. Is number six different from number five? Yes, because the subject matter is still 
the subject matter who's the employee, and the house is still alive. So number four is terminated because of the death of the offeror. Number five, the destruction of subject matter. And number six, we have a contract. Now, Taylor, he's dead. Who are you going to who, who, who are we going to hold liable? One of your tax students should tell me. It would be his estate. Would step in the interview shoot. Brandon made the employment offer to Allie to work for her for a period of six months as administrative assistant. Allie, where are you at? She was obviously working for you. There was no discussion of salary. Allie agreed. Now, first of all, Brandon. I think Allie is not very smart. What do you think, Tina? Would you agree to work for somebody without discussing salary? No. So, Zenith, do we have a contract? No. Why not? Megan, the offer is not definite. Hmm. Number eight. Here's question number seven. Should the Brandon work for Allie? Oh, Delaney, I screwed this up too. Assume that Allie worked for Brandon. Thank you. Allie worked for Brandon for one month and quit, quit after he discovered that, uh, that Brandon had no intention of paying. Assume for the sake of this question, Delaney, that we have no valid contract in number seven, would the, and, 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 and can this hear the law should favor whom? The employer is trying to take advantage of the employee or the dumbass employee? The law should favor the employee. So therefore, but we have no contract. So what's the remedy? Promissory estoppel, that is, uh, he made it, the offer was made, there's no contract, but the offer was made, and there's reasonable reliance into his detriment. So this is an offer of promise and stop. I think that's it. Very good. We'll see you next time. Next time when you come in, give Angela your uh, assignment, which I will post on Blackboard sometime today. And we'll see you next time.